myself. <laughs> well, I was the only soprano until five minutes ago. <laughs>
Good morning, sunrise. <laughs> Please stand if you're able and greet your neighbor and wave to the Zoom land. <laughs> Zoom. Oh, Zoom. Zoom. Oh, Zoom. Zoom. Oh, 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 Zoom. Oh,
have been called to the banquet. This is the feast. You have been summoned to the wedding. This is the feast of life and light. From the streets and the byways, God has invited us. We have come to the banquet that has no end. Hallelujah. Amen. Please stand for hymn number 462, I Love to Tell the Story. Let us come before the throne of God, the mercy seat, with all of our humanity open to the peace of promised forgiveness. You invite us to your feast, O God, and we do not come. You beg us to give thanks for life, and we fail in our thanksgiving. You have made for us a wonderful earth, and we neglect the gift. Forgive us for what we have done, and for abandoning the pathway you desire for us. Be our guide and conscience. Turn our feet and hands to your will, that all we do might give glory to you. Amen. The God of peace who calls all creation to live in unity, hears our plea. In the spirit of feasting and thanksgiving, in the mercy of the Almighty God, you are forgiven. For the sake of Christ Jesus, our Savior, who died and rose from dead to destroy the shroud of despair, rejoice.
Your word, O oh God, is a feast all its own. Let your Holy Spirit open our minds to your call and to listen. For we know your holy word heals and reconciles your people. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, which is found on page 198 in the New Testament of your Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. However, I'm um, using the New International Version. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, for whom I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Judea and I plead with Sintesh to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have struggled at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament passage from the Gospel of Matthew is in chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Hear now God's word to God's people. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying this, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those <clears throat> who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. And the king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all with whom they found, both good and bad, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see his guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this gospel passage is a really tough passage to wrap our heads around. And even though it is stated by Jesus as a parable, it is an allegory in that the characters in the parable represent other real characters in the kingdom of God. The king in the story, we may surmise, represents God, and the kingdom is God's kingdom, and the Son is the one whom we know as God's Son, Jesus. The first ones who are invited are the people of the nation of, he of the Hebrew nation, the Israelites, whom God first called to be God's people and to be a blessing on the nations. Well, there is a depth and meaning in this passage that easily escapes the casual reading 
for it is so filled with conflict and an exaggerated sense of dread that it leaves us feeling a bit shocked as we end its reading. So we have to consider that it is not only a reminder to a people who have become too busy or too complacent to attend a wedding because they have better things to do, but it's an actual warning to all of Christ's followers that we must also heed. So if we were to consider this passage to be an indictment of our own lukewarm faith, we might become convinced that God will invite others to the wedding if we ourselves are not able and willing to attend. And that's entirely possible. We also might look at the socio-political context of these verses that Matthew has written to and for an audience of first century Christians who lived in a time much different than our own. Matthew's audience was really living this story themselves. They were the Jewish Christians who were not fully separated from their own Jewish tradition. And by the time of the writing of Matthew, it is late in the first century, and scholars tell us that the people who have relied on the order and the structure of the temple for the worship of God are also displaced because now the temple has been destroyed. And so these early followers of Jesus who met in houses and upper rooms, who faced persecution and who have been dispersed even to other nations, are people who are true followers of Jesus who live in conflict with their society and even with their own families. So we hear between the lines of this passage the inevitable tension between grace and gratitude. One follows the other quite simply, but not easily. The grace of God is extended, a beautiful invitation to God's own people to come to a wedding. And after being refused by those whom God had called to be a blessing to the nations, God extended the invitation to the whole world, to the good and the bad alike. Come, come to the wedding, come and be entirely present at the wedding of my son. Put on a wedding robe, a sign of your acceptance of my invitation, and be pre fully present at the festivities. Come and sit at my table and enjoy my company and celebrate this wonderful occasion with me. Come and be my people, and I will be your God. Gratitude for the invitation to be at God's table and his guests among his guests looks like this we immediately make up our mind, yes or no, to attend the wedding. We don't put the invitation on the desk where it will get covered up by all the junk mail that comes in this week. We don't mention it in passing to the rest of the family to gauge whether there's any interest in going. Each one of us receives our own special invitation by special delivery, and it is imperative that we make up our own minds whether or not we will attend. Because if we're going to feel excitement about being included in the kingdom of God, and if we are to be respectful of the invitation which we have received, then we must not treat this as just another obligation that we put on our calendars and put in, a, put in an appearance. The wedding guest that is mentioned in the last verses of this passage, who arrived at the wedding and was not wearing a wedding robe, had obviously not taken the invitation seriously. Perhaps he had only slipped in the door with, with his beautifully engraved invitation, intending to fill a plate from the buffet line and slip out the door to meet his friends. So why put on a wedding robe when he's only planning to be there for a few minutes? Well, it's evidence that his heart is not in the right place and an explanation for why he was ousted by the king. And also, it's an, in, it's an example of ingratitude for the grace which he was so generously given. So not only are we to make up our minds about whether or not we will send an enthusiastic yes as our RSVP to this invitation, we must also prepare for the wedding. Just as we would make preparations to, spend, to attend a special event in our lives today, 
And I think that sometimes we think that we have an in with God because we have confessed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And maybe we think of our acceptance of an invitation to the big event that makes our salvation secure and our place in heaven guaranteed. But we can read this passage again and we can be struck by the fact that the first ones invited did accept the invitation. The king was expecting them to attend the wedding. He had made preparations for them and had invited them and waited for them to arrive. I'm surprised that there weren't a few like the one at the end who was not wearing a wedding robe. At least a few could have gone to the wedding thinking they were fulfilling their obligation. But instead, they must have considered that they were part of the family already and Well, they were meaning to go, but they just couldn't get away. So does that ever happen to you? Do you ever know deep in your gut that God has been inviting you to join God in some way, but you hurry on past that feeling? Andrew Purvis, in his commentary on this passage, draws from Calvin and others to present to us an interesting interpretation of this reading. He discusses the idea that many were invited to the wedding, but no one came. And then others were invited, and those came, and both were good and bad. They were invited to the wedding, they were given an invitation, they were welcomed to the wedding. And there was an expectation that they would comply with the terms of the invitation, that is, wearing the appropriate clothing. Pervin quotes Calvin, who in his commentary on this text, suggests two Pauline references to explain this reasoning. The first comes from Romans 13, verse 14, and it states that we must put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And also in Galatians 3, verse 27, we read that because we were baptized into Christ, we are clothed with Christ. So perhaps that's what the wedding robe means, that we are clothed with Christ. Purvis suggests that there are two parts of the invitation to the wedding. The first part is a universal invitation to everyone. Come and enjoy the banquet. You are welcome. All are welcome here. But the second part of the invitation is the part that requires a decision on our part. Will we accept and attend and follow the instructions in the invitation? Will we faithfully and willingly discipline ourselves to show our respect and our gratitude to the Lord Jesus Christ by wearing the appropriate garments? Purvis's writes that when we are clothed with Christ, wearing the wedding garment, because grace is freely given, we are situated in God's company by an act of loving election. And as a consequence, we are obliged to live as God's people according to God's will for our lives. And to do so is to give honor to the king, to God, and to live in terms of God's claim upon us. It would tell something, it would tell something about our relationships with each other or with our loved ones if we were to be invited to the most important event of our loved one's life and just not care if we attend. Wouldn't that be a good illustration for this passage? To be so distracted or so busy that we appear disinterested. And it would hurt the one whom we ignore or neglect to the the point of damaging our relationship. And it also might say something about our character (coughs) that we don't care about anyone or anything but ourselves. But those who love and follow Jesus Christ will receive the invitation and respond immediately with an enthusiastic yes. Yes, we will attend, and yes, we will take the time necessary to prepare for the wedding, to order our priorities so that there is time every day to do a little bit to to prepare to be well rested and to be engaged in the present world, to notice the people around us and their needs, 
to be prepared if someone calls and needs a ride to the wedding so that all can arrive on time to be refreshed <clears throat> and to be ready to greet the king and his son and spend valuable and precious time in their presence to put on the proper attire, which according to Tom Long means that it undoubtedly stands for acts of goodness and kindness, which would be seen as signs that a person truly was trying to live in God's way. Well, the Apostle Paul, as you heard in Philippians 4, has very high expectations for all of us and himself. He expects and promotes right living and right attitude that is befitting of one who has proclaimed allegiance to Jesus Christ. He desires of us the same devotion to Christ and to Christ's ministry that he is willing to give. And he reminds us how hard it is to maintain the high standards of ethical Christian conduct. But he also reminds us that we are justified by Christ's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So as we seek to live in faithfulness to Christ's calling, may we follow him in all the ways that he calls us. And as grateful people, may we respond to his calling with faith, hope, and love. May it be so. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith. We believe that the unity of the people of God must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways, that we share one faith, have one calling, 
are of one soul and one mind, have one God and Father, are filled with one spirit, are baptized with one baptism, eat of one bread and drink of one cup, confess one name, are obedient to one Lord, work for one cause, and share one hope. Today, our joys and concerns, um, we want to uh, pray for the Salvation Army. We also have a joy with the Salvation Army in that we've got all of our volunteers needed for this month's uh, serving of their evening meals. Um, we want to delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you desires of your heart. We also ask for prayers for Judy Weber, Nadine Griffin, Louise Simcox, Janet Atterbury at, at the Manor, Friends of Sunrise, uh, Ruth Self's daughter, Gail Rush. She's out of the hospital and in, um, I think, pinnacle care is what I, if I recall correctly. Um, Jim uh, DeSelms, brother-in-law of Sharon Harrington, Sammy Couch, friend of Judy Wooten, and our sympathy goes to uh, the family of Ann Ramsey, who Ann was the mother of Joe Peterson. Are there any other joys or concerns? Okay, and so Mary. Well, these are the times when we're trying to talk to you about uh, the fact that we need to continue our giving so that this church will go forth and do the job and the, and the work of the Lord. As part of the Nurture Committee, uh, it's kind of interesting. We kind of get to spend money in fun places, like uh, we get to spend it for uh, birthday parties. Like if somebody else will have another 100th birthday this year, I'd be happy to do it again. Um, we support um, the camp. Uh, that's been a huge support uh, for a long time, the work of that uh, group. We do a lot of other things. Uh, our fifth Sunday dinners are, uh, will be part of the Thanksgiving feast. Um, we uh, also try to welcome and encourage uh, people who we see who are new in the congregation, uh, so give out little bags that tell them that, that we care about them and that we would like to see them back. There are lots of little things that we do and it's not one big uh, thing. So we ask you to support the work of this church in all ways, whether it's through uh, nurture or mission or whatever. Thank you. The Christian Ed um, Committee, <laughs> as loose as it is, uh, has some overlap. Um, this past year, some of the funds that were spent were uh, from Heartland Day Camp, and we also helped pay a third for one of our youth to go to uh, the Kansas City for the counseling to learn about that. Uh, we paid a third, Presbytery paid a third, and the family paid a third. We also are the money this past year, um, we gave a donation to, for the women's retreat to help offset expenses. And uh, for our young ones, as you may recall from a couple of months ago with the little cards that we put in uh, the weekly uh, bulletin, we are uh, trying this year to uh, help lay a foundation with our young people. Now, we obviously don't have very many young people, uh, but, and so this is kind of an outreach as well as uh, Christian Ed for the three little ones that we have. Spark House um, is a subscription that Presbytery has, and we can use their subscription uh, to Spark House, and we uh, download, um, we'll be downloading every week a little sheet that has, might have coloring, has a little bit of a story in it, and things uh, related to the Bible. And then it also has on the Spark House Bible that where the kids can go and look it up, either by themselves or if they're older or with their parents. And so what we are doing is the church has bought, uh, purchased uh, three 
Spark House Bibles that will go to our three uh, little ones, young ones, the Courtney, Colton, and, and Lydia, um, probably next week will be presented if everyone's here. And then once a week, we'll download off the uh, Spark House website. Um, Edie will send out then in the mail to uh, the other children, not only those three children, but other children like grandchildren or that type of thing, um, those maybe great-grandchildren, and we'll, they'll get a piece of mail each uh, week that they can color and, and things, and, and hopefully their parents will go over them, and it'll have the grandparents, like as in myself, I'm purchasing a Spark House Bible for my grandson and going to mail it to him, so he can then coordinate and, and look what he's getting in the mail and then read the Bible passage in the Spark House Bible. And so it's, it's set for if some of our grandchildren may be getting regular and, and wonderful uh, daily teachings from the Bible and from their family and their churches. And some of our grandchildren maybe aren't getting regular that. So uh, this has helped to connect if we can help lay a foundation for any of these uh, young people is what our goal is. Uh, the cost of the uh, mailings and the uh, postage has been donated. And at this point in time, it's free to download it off the Spark House because of Presbytery's um, subscription to that. So uh, the time basically is Edie's cost of uh, downloading it and stuffing the envelope at uh, this point in time. And so I think that kind of covers Christian Ed. At, hopefully at this point in time, if you have any questions, just feel free to uh, catch me um, after church sometime. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we lift up to you the things that are in our hearts and our minds today. And we know that we have read many things online or in the newspaper or seen on the television about the things that are happening in the Middle East. <coughs> There are just no words to express how devastated we feel in the sights and the sounds of people at war are disturbing and upsetting. But God, we know that you are a great and a wonderful God and that you love and you care for all people, that you love and you care for the people of Israel and the people of Palestine and the people who are trapped in Gaza. And so we lift up these concerns to you, knowing that there is very little that we can say except to plead with you to fill the hearts and the minds of those who are in conflict bring some kind of peace into that area of the world. Help our leaders make good decisions. Help us make good decisions as we go to the polling places and cast our ballots. Help us to be your people, your people who wish to serve you and love you and follow you in all the ways that you call us. And having no other words to lift up except to th say thank you, O oh God, for your presence in our lives. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to be our Savior. And thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit to work among us and to lead us and guide us. We pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
because God has given you a great banquet, let your thanksgiving overflow with joyous giving for the sake of others. God of compassion and generous love, we give you thanks for the riches of earth which sustain our lives and which you have created for our joy. We thank you for Jesus, whose life, death, resurrection, and ascension renews our strength and revives our hope. We give you thanks for the Holy Spirit who comes among us, invites us to dine with each other and with you, and keeps us in faith. Bless these gifts for the sake of those in need and the work of your church. In peace, we pray our thanksgiving. Amen. Amen.
friends, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, but do not worry. With thanksgiving, speak to God your needs and the needs of the world, and ponder what is pleasing and, pleasing and excellent. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May it be so. Amen.